In June of 2015, Pastor Anthony Thompson's world was turned upside down. Tragedy struck, but he has allowed God to take that tragedy and use it to touch lives all over the world for good. This is our conversation. Pastor Thompson, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it very much. Well, thank you for being here to do this. I appreciate it. I wonder if you take me back to June of 2015. Walk me back through the events that took place on June 17 and leading up to that time. Well, on June the 17th, 2015, prior to the Bible study for that night, um, Myra was just at home trying to get a Bible study lesson together. She had everything spread over the dining room table. She's a perfectionist. She wanted to get 100% and she told her you can get 99, but not 100. She wanted me to help her. Of course, I was done. I was like, I had enough of this. And, uh, but something unusual was going on that morning because uh, she had this glow about her. And I, I found out later on what it was. But at the time, I didn't understand. It, it, she moved around the house. It was not like she was walking. It was like she was actually floating. And she had this overwhelming smile and, and joy. She was just overwhelmed with joy. I could understand. I know I didn't make her feel that way. <laughs> and I wanted to ask her, but then I said, I'll wait until she returns from Bible study because I, I wanted her to keep that moment. You know, it was just a beautiful moment. Um, then all of a sudden, she was ready to go. And we never leave the house without saying, hugging each other at the door, kissing, love you, goodbye. Well, that never happened that day. Um, for some reason, she got to the door and I just couldn't get there. And I, I could hear her say, honey, come on, I'm getting ready to go. Come on now, you know, I, I, I can't leave the house. Until you come to the door, but I just couldn't get to the door. And um, she's walking to the car and I can hear her outside saying, okay, I'm to the car. I have to meet me to the car. Next thing I know, she's talking to somebody on the phone. I found out later on she was talking to our daughter who was in Charlotte at the time, but I didn't know that then. And um, well, that's the last time I saw her. I never had the chance to say goodbye. How did you find out about what had happened at Mother Emanuel Church that night. How did you find out? Well, I was here because we had a vacation Bible school for the first night. As a matter of fact, she's the one who, who, who told me to come because I wanted to be at the Bible study, her first Bible study. And we always support each other. But for some reason that night, she, she kept telling me she didn't want me to go. She didn't want me to be there. She said, you go to your church. She said, because... It's going to be the first night and the ladies may have a lot of drama going on. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and, I, and I said, really? And so that got me to come here. So you may well have been at the church that night. Yeah, I wanted to be there. I, my intentions were to be there. And for some reason, I told her I was coming. And I don't even know why I told her because normally she would expect me to be there. So I would have to say I'm coming, but I, I just blurted it out. And she said, no, I don't want you to come. And we went back and forth like for about five minutes was, I'm coming, no, you're not coming. I'm coming, no, you're not coming. Uh, so I didn't understand it at that time. Of course, afterwards, I understood it very well. And so that's what brought me here. And for some reason, I couldn't get away from here to get to the Bible study that night. And so upon leaving here, I went home thinking she would be there before me because normally on Wednesday, she'll get home before I do. But she wasn't there. Um, I remember her saying she wanted a certain kind of food. So I, I ran out to get that to make sure I have it when she gets home. And I, I'm thinking she would get home. She would be there by the time I get back. She still wasn't there. So I thought something was unusual. Then I received a phone call. One of the members from Emmanuel Church called and said, uh, well, first she called. She said she, she wanted to speak to Myra. I said, well, she's not here. She said, well, she has to be home. We just had a meeting. I left the meeting. She left the meeting, so she should be home. I said, well, no, they have Bible study. She said, oh, yeah, I forgot. They have Bible study that night. So 
Myra left the meeting, went to Bible study. And so she told me to hold on the phone because somebody else was ringing her. She came back to the phone. She said, Reverend Thompson, you need to go to the church. I said, well, I just left my church. She said, no, Emmanuel. She said, shooting is going on around the church. And I just dropped everything. Ran out of the door. I don't, I don't remember locking my door. Got in my car, headed down to Emmanuel. Got there like one of the first responders because we're like five minutes away from Emmanuel. And I ran into a police officer, had the street blocked. By the time he and I exchanged conversation about what was going on, he told me that they took everybody out of the church, took them to the hotel, which was adjacent to Emmanuel, right across the street. So I'm thinking everything's okay. So I take another street, jump out of the car, and I'm running down Meeting Street, which is where I'm at now. I'm, I'm just maybe a minute from the church. I'm passing this service station, and I see nine ambulances strategically parked, no lights, nobody's sitting aside. So I'm thinking, he didn't tell me everything. Because you know, I, was an, I was a retired agent for 27 years, been in situations like that, so I knew something else was, something else was wrong. Anyway, I proceeded to the hotel, got there, I'm trying to find out where, where everybody is. I got to a room, opened the door, and I saw this Polly Shepard, who was one of the survivors. She had her head laying down, and she, she was just upset. I've been crying. I just, then I looked to my left, and I saw Sister Felicia Sanders and her granddaughter. There were two other, two other survivors, and they didn't see me. I mean, they're just crying and consoling each other. And so I'm trying to figure out where's my wife and where's everybody else. And then on my way out of the door, Felicia Sanders turned around and looked at me. She said, Anthony, Myra has gone. I'm like, okay, I'll wait till she gets back. She said, no, 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 she's gone. I said, I told you I'll wait till she gets back. She said, no, Anthony, she's not here anymore. She's gone. And I'm like, no way, no way. Tell me what goes through your mind. No way, what, how, how do you feel? How do you react? Tell me about the flood of emotions you experience. Well, I just started getting scared, you know, cause I'm like, it's, it's just no way she could be gone. Mm. So I run out of the door and I get outside the hotel. And I'm, I'm laying down on the hotel's um, flower bed. And I'm looking at the church, trying to figure out how to get over there. By that time, this is surrounded by first responders, FBI, DEA, SLED, everybody. And something said, just get up and run. And I got up and I ran. I don't, and I got by everybody. I don't know how it happened. I got past everybody. And I got to the gate and I'm like, I'm almost there because the gate I was going to was a side door at Emmanuel Church where police officers was coming back and forth. I was trying to get to that door. As soon as I opened the gate, before I could even get inside the gate, somebody snatched me back. And um, I found out later on it was an FBI agent. But we tussled for a while because I was trying to get, I was like, I need to get in there. And he's like, you can't go. I said, well, I'm going. I said, you need to get out of my way. So it took five people to hold me down. Five people came and they held me down. So I asked a lot of questions about what's going on. No answers. And I'm thinking, you know what? And then, then my, my, my experience is kicking in. And I'm like, okay, I'm asking the wrong questions. I said, well, is there anybody in there who was in Bible study? They said, oh, yeah. I said, well, if they're in there, why can't they come out? And he said, well, I can't tell you. that. Everything was, I can't tell you. So I figured out by then, either she's dead or she's in there suffering, about to die. <sighs> I just couldn't take it. You know, I lost control right away. You know, I fell down on the ground right on the pavement of Calhoun Street and I just wallowed crying, you know, saying, I don't know what to do because she's gone. I don't know. You know, it, it was over. I just knew I had no more purpose in life. And this is what I'm thinking. And while I'm on the ground, I hear his voice say, get up. A very harsh voice. So I'm looking up to see if it's one of the first responders. 
I'm trying to figure out why, why are they being so harsh with me? And then I heard a voice again say, get up. And I didn't see anybody. Third time I said, get up. I said, you know what? This is, this is, this is the Lord. God, God, what do you want? And I'm like, well, why are you, you know, why are you so harsh? You know, you just tell me, get up. No, this is the Lord, fear not, nothing like that. Just get up. And so I got up. And I'm like, I don't even want to hear what you have to say, you know. And he's reminding me. He's telling me, well, remember what you tell your congregation? Almost every Sunday you tell your congregation if, if something happened to one of their people, and she can relate to this, and one, if something happened to one of your people, you know, if, if you lose a wife or a husband, a son or a daughter, they die unexpectedly, and you cherish their body, you cherish God, what are you going to do? This was happening in your mind right then and there. This yeah. was still fresh and raw. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's taunting me like, and I'm like, why? You know, why you bother me at a time like this? I, I don't even want to hear what you got to say, you know, but he's just coming on strong. And so, Next thing I know, he's, he's giving me scripture. You know, yeah, this is why I want you to preach Sunday. And I don't even think about Sunday. You know, St. Luke, 17th chapter, never forget it. I came here that Sunday and I preached it, but, you know, I, I didn't, of course, I didn't know what it was right away. Afterwards, I went home and read it, and it says, uh, things will happen in life that cause you to stumble. And, but woe to those who, who, who cause one of my little ones to stumble. Um, they'd rather have a millstone tied around their neck thrown into the sea than to bother one of my little ones. And I'm like, what, what's that got to do with me? <laughs> really? You know, this is what you want me to preach? Okay. But then further on, it says forgive. It says forgive those who do you wrong. Then it goes on to say if they, if they, if they offend you 70 times in a day and 70 times come back and repent and say, I'm sorry, you have to forgive them. I'm like, yeah, who? Because at that time, I, we, didn't, we didn't know who it was, you know, Dylan or anybody. And I wasn't thinking about him, so I'm trying to figure out why, what is the scripture all about? Well, anyway, 48 hours after that, after that night, we have a bond hearing. And I'm at home in my pajamas. And my daughter comes to me and says, oh, Father, you know they're having a bond hearing, and, and we need to go. I'm like, I'm not going to no bond hearing. For what? You know, I was an agent for 27 years. Like I said, I've taken a lot of people to bond hearings. My understanding, you go to a bond hearing, they set a bond to determine whether the person's going to get out of jail or stay in jail. They go back to their cell. I didn't find it to be very important. So I'm like, I'm not going. And so my daughter came and she said, well, I understand, Father. You don't go, we won't go. And that's what got me up. Because... I felt like I was being selfish. I said, okay, we're going. I said, well, we're not going to say one word. And I was very adamant about that. I said, when we get there, we're going to be there for a few minutes. Keep your mouths closed because this never happened to us before. Whatever you say, you're going to hear it again. And so we went, got to the barn here, and I'm sitting down. <laughs> I'm looking at my watch, and I'm looking at them to make sure they keep their mouths closed. And the first voice you hear is Nadine, who was, um, uh, whose mother was, Ethel Lance, was one of the persons killed. And she's telling Dylan, Lord, have mercy on your soul and I forgive you. And so I look at my, my children, I said, when she gets through, we're leaving. And they look at me and said, okay. And so I said, as soon as she sat down, we're getting up. And Nadine went and sat down, we were getting up. And the magistrate came out and said, is there anyone here and Myra Thompson, Myra Thompson family who wants to speak. I look at my kids and I say, shut up. Don't say anything. He said, is anyone? He asks us again. Before I know it, I, that same voice say, get up. I'm like, not again. So I got up. You know, the thing about that voice is, you know, I recognize that voice that night and again because I know that voice. If you have a relationship with the Lord, you know when he's talking to you. He, and, and the first time I ever heard his voice is when I was seven years old. He told me I was going to be a preacher. I told him, no. <laughs> I was like, no, not me. Anyway, he won that battle. And so I knew it was him. And I got up. I walked to the podium. I'm saying, okay, you better come on because I don't have anything to say. If you got something to say, you better tell me because 
Don't embarrass me up here like this. I don't have anything to say. And next thing I know, he's saying, I want you to get a good look at Dylan. I want you to get his attention. I'm like, really? How's that going to happen? He's behind a screen, you know? So I'm like, this is ridiculous. The next thing I know, I'm saying, son, I forgive you. My family forgives you. But we would like you to take this opportunity to repent, confess, repent, give your life to the one that means the most, Christ. And when I said Christ, he lifted his head. And he glanced at me and I'm like, oh my God, he heard us. He heard it. God knows what he's talking about. Then I went on to say, if you do that, you're in a lot of trouble right now. You'll change your ways. You'll change your attitude. And if you do that, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's going to happen to you, you're going to be all right. And I'm on my way to my seat. And I'm on my way to my seat. I just, I began, I started shaking. And I asked my children, did you see me shaking? They said, no, you weren't. I said, yes, I was. But then when I thought, when I thought about it, it, looking at the room was like only Dylan and I were only two in the room. Didn't see anybody else while I was going through this. And the next thing I knew, I just, my body just started shaking and felt like things were leaving me. And from, from my shoulders on down to my hands, the next thing I know, I'm, I'm light as a feather. And I feel this peace like no other. And I'm, I'm like, what just happened? But I'm just so peaceful. You know, I mean, he took it all. He freed me. God freed me from the anger and the hate. He freed me from the sorrow, even the sadness I was feeling about my wife. He just took it all away. And I experienced a peace, that peace that surpasses all understanding. I, that's what I experienced. Now, I'll preach that. My members can tell you, I'll preach that sermon I don't know how many times. And I thought I was telling them how to get that piece, and we had it, and I had it. We didn't have it, because I felt it that day. And now you do. Now I do. Nine people were shot dead. Yeah. In cold blood. Cold blood. They'd gone to church to study the Bible. Mm -hmm. This is the last place you expect a crime like this to happen. Yeah. And adding a complicating layer to it. This was a hate crime. This was a white man who went to a black church for the purpose of fomenting hate and causing trouble. Yes. How did that fact, that additional complicating factor play on you? This is South Carolina. There's no shortage of racial tension from time to time or maybe any time. And this was done purposely to stir up a racial hatred. Yeah. So as a black man whose black wife was shot by a white man intentionally, yes. tell me how that played on you, played with your mind, got at your heart. How did, and, and, and was that an extra difficulty to overcome or in the final analysis did it make no difference? Well, to be honest with you, I never thought about that. You know, Dylan was the farthest thing from my mind, you know, all I can think about was my wife, you know, how, you know, just, just what was she going through? You know, why, why, why wasn't I there? So Dylan never once came to my mind. And, and once I forgave him, that piece I had, I didn't question anything. A murder happens. Nine people are left dead. Countless families are upended and thrown into confusion and a haze that most of us could never imagine. And here's a man whose almost first impulse is to forgive. We must find out more, and we will, as my conversation with Pastor Anthony Thompson continues in just a moment. What does the Bible say about astrology? Why do bad things happen to good people? What color is Jesus? If you have a question, we'd love to find an answer for you from the Bible. Line up online from It Is Written TV. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV for the first time. They're watching their favorite It Is Written episodes, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here. 
here and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free on Roku and Apple TV or visit itiswritten.tv. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800-992-2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. Thanks for joining me. This is Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My very special guest is Pastor Anthony Thompson. In June of 2015, received the very shocking news that his wife, Myra, was among nine individuals who lost their lives in a very tragic shooting here in the city of Charleston, South Carolina. But you're much more than a victim. You're much more than somebody. Your story goes way beyond that. You're a church pastor. You've mentioned already 27 years as an agent. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little more about yourself, your background and, and your history. You served your country, for example. Yes, I did. Well, I was brought up in a Christian home. My mom and dad strict about us going to church, Sunday school. So I was involved with Sunday school, being on the pulpit, being the lay readers and doing everything possibly that you possibly could do in the church. So I became a pastor. So I guess it was like God's plan already. I was in that direction. However, I ran from it. <laughs> and that's when I pursued other avenues, you know, went to college, left college thinking I was going to be a school teacher. And I did an intern at a school, some high school students, who I thought maybe this is not for me. That changed your mind. <laughs> yeah, that changed my mind. And then I took a, what I call a left turn and I became a uh, liaison, a uh, court liaison, li liaison officer, you know, helping people who had drug problems, trying to um, give them an alternative to going to jail and being in our program. Then from that, I became a probation agent, you know, for the state of South Carolina, which you, which you heard I retired of 27 years. But during the course of all this, I mentored ch children from year, one years of age to 21 years of age for 40 more years, still doing it right now, especially those who were physically sexually abused. Yeah, really, really targeted, targeted them. So yours has been a life of service. A lot of service. Helping troubled people. Yes, always. Uh, you made a very interesting decision to forgive. Why do you think it was important for you to forgive? I'm going to ask you in a moment why it's important for others to forgive. The answers will be related, but maybe not quite the same. Why was it important for you to extend forgiveness? Well, at the time, I didn't have no idea that I should or should not forgive. You know, just wasn't, my mind wasn't there. Um, be honest with you, it was just, God's divine intervention. You know, he just came in, put me in a place where I didn't want to be, <laughs> had me doing something that I really had no idea what I was doing. And then when I did it, that's when I discovered that forgiveness was for me. What did forgiveness do for you? It gave me a peace. You know, it, it, it enabled me to move forward in my life because prior to that, I had already given up. You know, I, I said, this is it. I don't know what to do. I have no more purpose. And, and I was really going through like, well, what am I going to do? Because I had already had in my mind everything I did was for her. So now she's gone. You know, my job is over. Not that I thought about taking my life or anything, but, you know, I just thought it was done. And then here God steps in and put me in a place I don't want to be, have me saying something I had no idea I was going to say all what it was going to do to me. And then when I received that peace, then he gave me a new purpose. Tell me about that peace. Explain that to me. Well, it's, it's a little hard to describe. It's like, for once, you know, when I was walling down on the ground on Calhoun Street in that pavement and crying uncontrollably, when I got up, when I got to the bond hearing, I was no longer in control. I was no longer out of control. God 
had taken control. That's the kind of peace I'm talking about. The peace of knowing that, you know what? Ma was gone, but God promised that she would be with him and she would see him face to face. Control, you know, the peace of knowing that, you know, he gave me new purpose because what I didn't tell you is when I received that peace, immediately after that, he came at me again and he said, okay, you got a new mission. And that is to spread the gospel of forgiveness. So he gave me a new purpose, you know, so that's what that peace entails. New purpose, God being in control of my life and me being able to move forward. This is such an important subject because everybody has forgiveness issues. Parents, teacher, employer, spouse, children, neighbor, colleague, mailman, everybody. Everybody has forgiveness issues somewhere. Mm -hmm. Tell me why from your point of view and certainly from a biblical point of view, you're a man of the Bible. Tell me why forgiveness is just so important. It is very important because the world interprets forgiveness as letting the person off the hook. Right. But forgiveness is not it's letting not. a person off the hook. It's not. It's letting yourself off the hook. Because the forgiveness is for the one who had been offended, not for the, the one who offended you. You know, it, it's, it's to grant you peace. You know, it's to give you the satisfaction that you're looking for sometimes in other means through hate or anger or revenge because that's the natural inclination of most people. You know, I'm going to get this person back. I'm just going to be angry. I'm going to be mad. But then this person doesn't know you're mad or angry. Neither do they have an idea that you're going to take revenge. So they're going on with their life like Dylan. Dylan has no remorse. You see? So, so forgiveness was not for him. It was for me. So that he can be, so that I can be released from Dylan's control. You see, his purpose was to start a race war have control, you know, to guide us in a certain direction, a violent direction, a direction that Satan himself would want us to go into. But then that forgiveness will release me from that. And it'll release our family, our church, and it'll release our community from that. That's a very interesting point, too, because many people were expecting that once nine people have been shot in an historic church by someone bent on hate, People believed, some people believed that Charleston could have just descended into an absolute mess. There could have been rioting and violence and anger and demonstrations, but none of that happened. So speak to me about the connection between the forgiveness demonstrated and how that impacted not just you, but as you mentioned a moment ago, the community. Okay. Well, first of all, like you said, the community did not expect that. The community did expect us to start a race war <laughs> like Dylan wanted. They expected us to burn down the city, find a white person, beat him to death or whatever. But forgiveness, the act of forgiveness conquered all that. You know, when you think about what Isaiah said concerning Jesus down on the cross, he said, by his stripes we are healed. That was 500 years before it actually happened. 500 years later, here comes Jesus down on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them for, for what we did to him. You understand what I'm saying? For they know not what they do. And the whole world was healed that day. Just like Isaiah said, by his stripes we are healed. And so that's what forgiveness does. And that's why the city and everybody reacted the way they did because of God's divine intervention. Forgiveness, an act of forgiveness, just bring God's in, bring him in. And he changes people's hearts. He changes people's attitudes. And that's what happened in the city of Charleston because everybody just came together. When you say people came together, tell me what, what that looked like. I mean, it affected everybody. Everybody was in tears. I mean, hugging each other, consoling each other, encouraging each other, wanting to do something to make somebody's life better. Not necessarily the, the, the loved ones of the victims, but any and everybody. It didn't matter. Whoever they came in contact with that day, they wanted to make your life better. You know, we had 15,000 or more people stretching hands across from Emmanuel Church across the two and a half mile bridge all the way to Mount Pleasant, praising the Lord, you know, and, you know, having a good time, 
trying to find out what can we do? What can we do different? Now you think about Charleston, South Carolina, back, okay, being the city where slaves came, I mean, it was, slavery was prevalent. You know, two thirds, two thirds of the slaves came here. And then after slavery, you know, where we language to, to, to a minimum, put it like that. Then you, you have a city like this who's very hospitable, but then you have the undertone of racism. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, but that day, it began to get lesser and lesser and lesser. For some reason, people began to just want to turn a new leaf. People began to understand what happened back then, what could have happened after the tragedy, and it didn't happen. You know, and I think people just started feeling shame and guilt, you know, and at the same time, you know, just a love for each other. I, I preached at a church, um, uh, predominantly white church in Mount Pleasant, and it was about your light of the world, and it had to do about forgiveness in the end. And a white lady about my age stood up and she said, Reverend Thompson, I used to be a racist. I'm like, okay, we need to clear this air. <laughs> what else is coming? She said, but I repented of racism when I heard about you and the families, other family members forgiving Dylan. She said, because I realized that, you know, God is real. And I realized I was wrong, you know, and I, she, she didn't want to be labeled with, 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 um, with, with um, Dylan, with his, his intentions of starting a race war. And she had the two boys there. She said, because she wanted them to be here for this occasion and hear what she had to say. And she talked about how she learned racism. You know, how when she got older, she found out it was still wrong, but peer pressure, status, and all this other stuff. But just the act of forgiveness alone is what brought her to repent. And after she got through one by one, white, male, female starts that up, same story. You know, so that's what forgiveness does. If you had stood up at that hearing and said, I hate you and you and your people are gonna pay, mm -hmm. if you'd taken the bait, yeah. what might have happened? It could have been really bad because you had people here. You had the Black Panther Party, you had Black Lives Matters, you had everybody who wanted to rebel, who wanted to start a march, who wanted to do something to instigate some kind of violence in the city of Charleston. And we told them, we don't need you here. So it could have been, yeah, it could have went the other way. But like I said, that forgiveness again kicked in and we told them, we don't need you here. And they left. You, you hear it in the documentary. One of, one of the guys said, you know what? We came here to rally, to rebel, to get things going, to do something about this. He said, but that act of forgiveness, he said, is over. Power of forgiveness. Yeah, it's over. Let me ask you a question. So, so we, racism is as old as the United States, older, you know, older, but in, in this country, it's as old as, as the country is. Uh, it seems to me that if you have uh, two peas here and two beans there, then they're going to find some reason to, 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 to not get along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is probably a question that would take a lifetime to answer, but from your perspective, if we're going to really experience healing from racism, what's it going to take? How do we get there? Well, that's what we're doing here in Charleston right now. Okay, the first thing we did, we started reaching across denominational barriers, cultural barriers. The church started. That's where it's supposed to start, in the church. And now the church is taking responsibility in the city of Charleston. And we, you know, like my church, for example, we're, 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 we're associating with some of the biggest predominantly white churches in the Charleston area. We're exchanging pulpits every Lent season. Our congregations exchange Churches, you know, Bible study, you know, everything, you know, trying to find out, you know, who are you? You know, you're, you're, you're more than just white and we're more than just black. We want to find out, you know, just who are you, Bob? Who are you? You understand what I'm saying? That's what we're doing. The mayor mandated a resolution recognizing, acknowledging and apologizing for the part that Charleston took in slavery. I mean, a very major part. Yes, a very major part. They did that on the anniversary date of the tragedy, just this, this last year. Okay. Um, 
The mayor just started a new department in his office for the first time anywhere in the United States of America called the Office of the Department of Racial Reconciliation. Just hired a new director for that position just last week. So those are the kind of things we're doing. Those are the changes being made in Charleston. We're now, we, we're talking about slavery. I mean, we were talking about racism. You know, we, we've had, we have forums, I don't know how many forums a year, talking about racial reconciliation. The mayor formed a team of a, called an advisory council of pastors, over 300 pastors, and the focus is on racial reconciliation, repentance, and forgiveness. I want to talk to you for a moment, and this is, this is going to take us, we'll talk up to the break and then beyond the break. But as a man of the book, as a man of the cloth, talk to me about, from your perspective, forgiveness from a biblical point of view. Forgiveness from a biblical point of view is that, first of all, it's a command. You know, you said it, God commands us to forgive. You know, and, and, and with that, he says, love one another as you love yourself. You know, and, 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 and it says, you know, forgive those who trespass against you. You know, and if you want me to forgive you, then you have to forgive those who trespass against you. So, so biblically, forgiveness is when you truly, sincerely from your heart forgive somebody. And when, once you've done that, you have no anger, no hate, no malice. You're not thinking about taking revenge. Secular forgiveness is people who say, you know, I mean, you, you, you're condoning this guy's crime. You know, I mean, so, you know, how could you forgive him, you know? And I'm not condoning his crime. He's, he's spending time, you know, so he's being, you know, he's, he, he's being penalized for what he did. But people do feel that if you forgive, then you're letting them off the hook. Yeah, you're letting them off the hook, you know? Um, and then they say, well, you know, forgiveness is a feeling. So they ask me, well, you're feeling like you wanted to forgive him, but it's not a feeling, you know, because first of all, you have nothing to do with what happens after you do it. You have nothing to do with it at all. It takes God to help you to forgive. Yes, it does. You're starting to touch on some very, very important things. We're going to explore them more. I'll be right back with Pastor Anthony Thompson. Forgiveness. Just a moment. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written, inviting you to join me for 500. Nine programs produced by It Is Written, taking you deep into the Reformation. This is the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. We'll take you to Wittenberg and to Belgium, to England, to Ireland, to Rome, to the Vatican City, and introduce you to the people who created the Reformation, who pushed the Reformation forward. We'll take you to sites all throughout Europe where the reformers lived and in some cases died. We'll bring you back to the United States and take you to a little farm in upstate New York and show you how God spread the Reformation here. Don't miss 500. You can own the 500 series on DVD. Call us on 888-664-5573 or visit us online at itiswritten.shop. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000. Or you could visit us online at itiswritten.com. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. We're talking about one of the most important things we could ever discuss, the subject of forgiveness. And you know, I know, people have forgiveness issues. But what we're talking about here is not a forgiveness issue. I mean, a moment ago, you talked about forgiveness and the command to forgive and how a person ought to forgive. And from a biblical point of view, you ought to forgive. And here's what I know. There are people who are still shaking their head Mm -hmm. And they're saying, I understand what he said. That's why I forgave my neighbor when his tree crashed on my fence. I forgave that. That's why I forgive that man in the parking lot who backed his car into my car and dented my fender. Yeah. People understand that. You step on my foot. I'm so sorry. Oh, think nothing of it. I understand it was an accident. Yeah. What your family has experienced, mm -hmm. what so many families have experienced in the wake of this terrible shooting in Charleston, 
was not someone standing on your foot. No. But what you're talking about is forgiveness without limits. Yeah. So I, I, I'd like you to challenge that person right now who is saying, I understand forgiveness when you borrowed my shovel and you knew you should have returned it, but you didn't, so you stole it. People understand that. Mm-hmm. But you're talking about forgiving one of the worst acts of hatred that could ever take place. You're taking us to a new place in forgiveness. Yeah. I mean, forgiveness is a choice. You know, God puts it before you to make that choice. And you have to let God be the judge. You know, he says, judge not and you be not judged. Condemn not, you be not condemned. And then right after that, he says, forgive. You know, um, because it, it's, 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 you know, you don't know this person's heart. You don't know what they went through in their life. You don't know who hurt them. You know, you don't know who offended them for them to do what they did to you. That's why God says, bless your enemies, right? Okay, it's a deeper understanding. Bless your enemies because it's not really that person. It's, 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 the, it's the evil that's in that person, like the evil that was in Dylan, you understand, that caused him to do what he did, you know? And so I can't help but bless him. You understand? Because first of all, he's a sinner, just like I'm a sinner. God forgave me, so why can't I forgive him? You know, I don't understand. Why can't a sinner not forgive another sinner? I mean, it just doesn't make sense if you can't. You know, I mean, because people look at like this, they say, well, I can't forgive him because I can forgive him because he lied to me, but I can't forgive him because he committed a murder. You know, we have this natural inclination again to make things one, one sin bigger and one smaller. Forgetting, of course, that it was that we're all murderers yeah. in as much as it was our sin that cost the life of Jesus. I understand someone saying, yeah, but that's different. And it is, and it isn't. You said a moment ago about uh, the feelings that accompany or don't accompany forgiveness. Walk through that because someone thinks that if I forgive you for some terrible thing that you've done to me, that suddenly I need to have you over, have Thanksgiving dinner, and we're going to walk arm in arm down Main Street. That's not the case. It's not the case. So how can you forgive without having those rosy feelings? Yeah. I mean, because a lot of people feel like reconciliation is part of forgiveness. And this is where the the point about, you know, well, when I forgive you, we're going to, we're going to pray together. We're going to hold hands. We're going to become friends, you know, but I never knew Dylan, <laughs> you know, so there's no reconciliation, you know, uh, it's so if, it doesn't take reconciliation to forgive somebody. There are sometimes there's some points where you may be a friend or it may have been a mother or father, a sister, brother, and you want reconciliation because you had something going on. You had a friendship, you had a relationship. And so you're forgiving, hoping you understand that we're going to get back together. Things are going to be much better. Yeah, it's a difference, you know, but it doesn't require reconciliation to forgive somebody. Right. No. Somewhere along the line, you made a decision that you were going to write a book. Talk to me about the process of writing a book that had to have been uh, cathartic on one hand and extraordinarily difficult on the other. You had to relive some things. You had to have some conversations. You had to go places in your thinking and in your heart. Talk to me about that process. Initially, it was pretty tough. I didn't want to do it. You know, I, I really didn't want to do it because I know, you know, what I was thinking at the time and I was still, I hadn't mourned yet, you know, and I was, I, was still, I miss my life every day. Uh, that's never going to go away. And so it took a lot of, pr- it took some prayers and some people praying for me, actually, yeah, mm-hmm. for this to go about. As a matter of fact, there's a pastor named Marshall Blaylock at First Baptist Church. That's the church where I preached that first about forgiveness. I think I was the first black to preach there. As the, and it's the first Baptist church in the United States of America. He and I got a close and, and he, he met his wife and she came to me. And she said, Reverend Thompson, I know you're going to write a book. I'm like, yeah. She said, no, I know you're going to write a book. I'm like, yeah. She said, no, I know you're going to write a book. And I'm like, okay, it was going to take her to get, get her off of me. Yeah, yes, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and then she said, well, I know somebody, I'll call them if you don't mind me passing you. I said, oh, go ahead. I figured that was a done deal. And the next day I get a call from this lady named Denise George. I'm like, what? 
She said, yeah, I heard you want to write a book. And the first thing came to my mind, the Spirit of the Lord came and said, pray about it. You're not ready. Because I knew I wasn't. I was still, I mean, I, you know, I didn't want to bring all that bad stuff back up. Mm -hmm. You know, I did not want to do that. I know taking a ride in a book would do that. Sure. You know, and I prayed. And the, the lady who called, she, she prayed with me. We prayed for about a month. Then her agent, he got in touch with me. And I told him, I said, nope, we're going to pray about this. You pray, I'll pray, she pray, and we'll see what God says. I said, because that's the only way that's going to happen. Was it a difficult process? Did you find it a difficult process or a helpful process or both writing the book? At first it was a little difficult, but then as I began to talk, because we communicated email, text, I went to Birmingham and, and, and stayed there for a couple of weeks and we talked. And so each step of the way, it was like venting. I began to get it out. I, I began to feel better. And I started seeing where God was in it. And then that's what made the difference. That's when it made it very easy to write because I knew he had a purpose in my life for writing it. And then I started thinking about what he said at the barn hearing, this is your new mission, gospel forgiveness. So I'm like, oh, okay, then this is your book, you know? And I call it his book. I don't call it my book, it's his book. You know, I say, so this is another way of getting it out. So as I began to talk about Myra and the, and the eight people, you know, and then getting into the seeing the good that God brought out of the tragedy, I was in awe. And then I became very comfortable. And then from speaking, before I actually wrote the book, speaking to people across the United States, I learned the, the, the real reason, you know, you know, I mean, well, God knows everything. I, I, I found out what he, he was saying, this is needed. Because I found out the people, the kind of questions they had, and they didn't know, they wanted to do it, didn't know how to do it. And so I gained all that knowledge and I was able to take that and put it in the book. Called to Forgive, explain the title. I've been in that situation so many times, but not with such a tr tragedy that happened mm -hmm. in my life concerning my wife. I can remember growing up, you know, having things thrown at from some, from a white person. And at first I didn't really understand what that was all about because my father was a military man. We were in the military. People in the military, we all got along, white, black, Asian, you know. So I came to Charleston and was like, wow, what was what that about? And my cousins, they were running behind this person, want to get this person back. And I'm standing in the corner like, why are they doing that? And then they come back to me and say, what's wrong with you? Why are you trying to get these guys? You know what they did to us? I said, yeah. I said, but why, why are we doing this? Then I learned about this racism. And I went home and I talked to my mom and dad about it. And, it's, and they said, well, did you run with them? You know, did you run with your cousin? I said, no. They said, well, good. I said, I said you're not, because you don't do that. Mm. You know? Where are we on race as a country? Where are we? You know, we started out. Uh, maybe eight or 10 years ago, trying to pull together, you know, trying to talk about this thing, trying to, you know, acquaint ourselves with each other. And then just maybe four years ago, it was thrown back in our face. And it's being thrown back in our face every day now. So we're almost back where we started, you know, um, clearly. And it's getting worse every day. You know, it only takes one person, okay? It only takes one person of authority. And that's the way I feel about this nation. You know, if you're in charge and you're expressing racism and you're taunting people with, because of their differences, then those who've been wanting to do it and been secretly hiding, they're gonna join the party. And that's where we are right now. Do you think everyday people, and you're the right person to ask about this because you witnessed people holding hands across a bridge and you witnessed people coming together and you witnessed and you heard people say, I was looking to do this, but my heart has changed. Mm -hmm. The man in the street, the woman in the street, is that person looking for a healthy way forward or are they looking to hang on to their hate? Very general question. Yes. But what do you see? They're looking to change. 
you know, but they're looking for somebody to motivate them to change somebody to, they're looking for somebody to say, you know what? I'm thinking the same thing you're thinking. And I know you've been thinking that for 10 years, but now that you know I'm thinking that we can, you know, we can get together on this, we can make some moves, you know, and that's what's happening here. You know, I can see people, people really want to change. I can remember there was a, the, the atmosphere was so cold one time when you open the door for somebody and they walk through the door and don't turn around and say thank you or nothing. Just like you're supposed to do that for me. Well, it's a little different now. You open the door and they turn around, oh, thank you. And they'll open the door back for you. So that's what I see. You know, I see it here. You see progress. And, yeah, I see progress. People are seeking, you know, to change, you know, and they're looking for a leader. They're looking for somebody to say, yeah, let's do this, you know? And, and so I'm telling you this forgiveness thing, people are latching on to it because they see that this is the way to do it. You know, we each have to start there. We have to start by forgiving each other, mm -hmm. you know, cause it's, it, it's not just a white thing. It's a black and white thing. It's both sides got to the point now where they're hating, they're angry and all this other stuff. You know, not talking about how it happened, but the point is that's where we are. So that's where we need to start. We need to start right there. You know, we need to start, stop defining each other by color, cultural differences, language barriers, and need to get to know each other. That's what we're trying to do here. That's who I am. You know, you know, I'm, I'm not, this is not who I am. My heart is who I am. So come to find out where I am here. And then we can begin to change, you know, because then we're going to find out that we have a lot in common and we got some of the same ideas and we want some of the same things. We're too scared to tell each other that for fear of, you know, putting yourself out there and being taken advantage of. But it's not going to, you know, so. What have you heard from people who've been impacted by your story or your experience? I've had people tell me that I, I've gotten all kinds of things from I started going back to church, haven't gone to church in years. Things from, I'm calling my mama right now. I'm getting on the plane. I'm going to tell my sister, I, you know, I forgive her. I had a, a, a young man, I was in Vermont and I was at, talking at an Episcopal church in Vermont. And this young man came up to me and he said, he said, I have a sister, a twin sister. And man, he said, we haven't talked to each other for 27 years. I said, y'all twins? The twins don't do that. He said, he said, well, yes, we do. He said, because well, she's waiting for me to apologize and I'm waiting for her to apologize. He said, what should I do? I said, be the bigger man. Call her up right now. Don't apologize. Tell her you forgive her. I said, she probably gonna tell you the same thing. He said, I'm gonna do that right now. And he did. And she told him the same thing. I told him she wouldn't. And he said, I'm going to see her tomorrow. Things like that. Yeah, I mean, and so, and that's where I get my reward. And so that's what made the book so interesting. That's what made it so good to write. I was able to get past, the, you know, the looking at the tragedy of something sad. Yeah. What do you think Myra, your wife, would tell you today about your ministry and, and, and going forward from here? Well, she would tell me, you're doing a great job, but you need to do more. <laughs> that's what she would say. <laughs> she would say, you're doing a great job, you need to do more. And um, I, I'm, uh, she, you know, she would encourage me. You spoke earlier about the peace she had yeah. that day, that terrible day, the peace she had as she was floating, not walking. Uh, there seemed to be something about her. Tell me a little about her. What kind of person was she? Myra was an extraordinary person. When I say extraordinary, I'm not defining it like you normally would. I'm beyond, the, I just can't come up with another word. She's a very loving person. She, she, she was a, a Loving wife, a loving mother, I mean, loving grandmother. She was a teacher, a counselor, a minister, but the greatest of her gifts was giving. I thought I was a giver. Can't, I, can't, I can't even touch her. Everything she did, from the time she was able to go out on her own and go to college, where well, she wanted to become a teacher, she wanted to become a teacher so she can benefit, other people can benefit. Not her. It wasn't about having a degree. You know, it was about getting that degree because somebody else needed your services. That's what she did. She went and got a master's in reading, master's in um, counseling for the sake of her students, the school she was teaching at. It was a very disruptive school with disadvantaged kids 
orphan kids. I mean, they had a lot of baggage, you know, and so they were very disrespectful, cursing and carrying on, but she saw beyond all that, she saw the real problem, and she went to school, they will come and fill that need, change the whole school, quiet down. I mean, it was quiet, the whole school became, started with a classroom name before the whole school quiet down, teachers would come get her. Then she said, then she went and got it in counseling because she wanted to get to them a little closer. And the kids who were not going to counseling started going to counseling. That's the kind of person Myra was. Myra, nobody was a stranger to Myra, okay? I remember after the tragedy, she had to rent a car. I took the car back to the rental place and people said, we're sorry what happens. I said, but your wife, they loved her so much. She just met them for five, maybe 30 minutes. And they said they fell in love with her so much. She told them how to do their job. She said, well, we don't, we're not going to accept any money. I went to pick up our car. Our car was being fixed at Nissan. Went to pick it up. People said, well, we heard what happened to your wife. And everybody from the, the, from, from the, from the maintenance shop, from the body shop, to the people who serve you, came and got me and told me, said, Man, your wife, wherever she went, she just took charge. <laughs> so but we love her to death. You know, she, nobody was a stranger to her. Remarkable person. Yeah, very remarkable. Yeah. What do you think Myra would say to that young man if she had an opportunity to speak to him right now? What do you think she'd say? She would not leave that young man until that young man gave his life to Christ. She would stay right there. Until she do, because that's the way she was. If she met you for the first time and she found out and you told her something about what you wanted to do, but you stopped before she left you, you she, you'd have a plan about how to get back on, get back on it. So that's what she would have done with Dylan. She would have stayed there with Dylan, prayed with Dylan, didn't matter how long it take till Dylan gave his life to the Lord. And if he had given his life to the Lord, she would have made sure he rededicated his life to the Lord because she would want to see him up there. Our prayer has to continue to be that one day she will. Yeah. And I know that's what she's hoping. You know, she's hoping that he does that so she can get, she, she you know, and, and that's where I come in at, you know, and that's why I wrote him that letter about her and about the fact that if he wants me to come help him to make that happen, I'll come help him make that happen because I know that's what she wants. You know, she want to be able to, to see him come there so she can say, oh, you finally made it. Thank God. Let me, let me introduce you to the Lord. She would want to do that, yeah. I have a feeling that because of this experience, because of your book, your ministry, God's book, yeah, God's your book. ministry, I got a feeling that many people are gonna find peace, forgiveness, and hope and faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you're doing. May God bless you. May God bless you, and thank you for making this possible, for getting it out there, spreading the gospel, forgiving us some more. Thank I you. appreciate your thank time. You. Here's Pastor Anthony Thompson. I'm John Bradshaw. And this has been our conversation.